1894, the already um, overcrowded collections of the University Museum, uh, that, con that situation induced the provost uh, William Pepper uh, to undertake to build a special museum, a building just to be a museum uh, for the collections, and to once and for all design a building that, like the library as it was intended, could be extended infinitely. They'd been hiring one architect or another from their young team to do these various buildings. They now, now they hired them all, and they said, all of you guys work on this design. <laughs> And so they hired Wilson Eyre, who's a name that you haven't mentioned before, Cope and Stewartson, and Frank Miles Day. And they said, okay, all you guys, you're already on payroll anyway. You know, in your spare time, design a museum that can be expanded and expanded and expanded. And on the back of your handout is the master plan for this building that they came up with. The first piece of it was opened in 1899. And we're standing in, that, in the courtyard of that first piece that they opened. Their first proposal was that the building should be in the style of ancient Rome, which was in, at that period of time in the early 1890s a very popular style for the new monumental buildings that we associate with America at this moment of its growing international colonialist, really, power. And in that context, this building, designed by these young men, well, they decided that it needed to be in the most potent, to be the most potent possible expression of, of America's uh, uh, cultural strengths. And so they chose Roman classicism. And, how can I put it, your alma mater and my employer said, that looks really expensive. <laughs> and try something else. They tried a whole bunch of different styles. They tried what we would call the Spanish mission style. You know, stuccoed walls, pretty cheap to do, red tile roofs, yep, that, no, but that, it looked a little too much like a resort hotel, you know, and so they, they put that aside. And then they, um, and then they, and then Wilson Ayer, we think, was the architect who came up with the idea of the vocabulary and the style that you see here, which is basically the style of Northern Italy in the 11th century. Northern Italian Romanesque. It's not because Italian culture in the 11th century was thought to be a particularly good model for the youth of America. It was because the big, simple brick forms of Italian Romanesque architecture were cheap <laughs> and flexible and were, in fact, could be subsumed within this wonderfully open-minded attitude towards style. It's just, a, it's a really handsome, strong style. And it became, and it was used by these architects particular, particularly as a vehicle for in, additions that were not coming out of Milan in the 11th century. The gateway that we walked under is very closely modeled on a temple precinct gate in Japan. The white marble enframement of the doorway that you see there is in fact based on a real church in Lucca in northern Italy, but it's a marble building and a building that is always cited as a very unusual building for the 11th century because it looks so classical, looks so ancient, and you mix that in. And then perhaps most beautifully, it's also the medium, this architectural vocabulary, for experiments in the decorative arts. And you can see all of the elaborate in, uh, mosaic tile work uh, that's worked into the, into the facades. Interestingly, weirdly, when you go inside, you'll discover you're not in 11th century Italy anymore. The inside is Roman classical. The inside corresponds to the original proposal for the outside of the building. And I've always thought, that you know, the university said, okay, got to do the outside cheap, but I'm, we're not going to pay for you to redraw all those drawings about the inside. We're just going to, just go ahead, just, just make it. Where it changes is when in, the university comes back, they intended to build the first rotunda, the first of the rotundas in the first building campaign. They actually laid the foundation for it and they abandoned them. And in the meantime, they figured out that they really needed a bigger auditorium, so they expanded the, the intended rotunda made it bigger with a huge round auditorium underneath it. And it's at that point, and only at that point, 
that they gave up doing a in classical interior, and that's why the interior of the rotunda and of the Egyptian galleries, which are now going to be soon go undergoing renovation, are this wonderful, austere, very modern vocabulary of arched forms, a kind of abstraction of the Romanesque. And looking, you know, looking, you know, like they were made in the 1920s. The, as, you, as the big plaque over the door says, this was chartered as the Free Museum of Science and Art. And it really wasn't clear what was going to be collected and what would be put in it. Because, um, and so they, they, it does seem to sort of allude to the fact that it might have been a natural history museum. And in fact, there was a conversation with the Academy of Natural Sciences in the 1890s about them moving here too. Because you can see the plan would have been big enough for all of it. So what, oh, so, so what happened with the plan, right? So, 18, so first little bit is in the Red Square. They build the one rotunda, intended to be one of three, but they only build one, and that opens in 1915. In 1922 to 26, they build what we call the Cox Wing, because it was paid for by the Coxes, who also funded our Egyptian excavations. They built the Cox Wing, which is basically the wing that's to the left of that first rotunda, that would have connected the first rotunda to the granddaddy of rotundas in the middle but they never built that one. What the final piece of the original plan that they built was the block that faces the lower courtyard with a fountain in the middle, the circular fountain in the middle, um, which is sometimes called the administrative wing, which was intended to be the main entrance of the museum. Um, uh, but uh, that did not get, uh, but th that was when it's, that was 1929. And like the quadrangle project, that's when it stopped. And when things got, when we revived after the war, excavations, had ceased to bring home the things they excavated because the world had changed. Col the colonial powers were no, the colonial lands were now independent countries and that old way of doing business had ended. Uh, and so what was built in the 1960s, in the 1970s, in lieu of the continued expansion of the museum was what's called the academic wing, um, which was essentially a home for the, uh, for the um, anthropology department and the, what, the, the location that was intended to be the grand central, central rotunda, that's where the library was. The library, in a sense, becomes the symbolic and physical heart of the, of the museum at that time. The Cox Wing, which was built for the Egyptian antiquities, was built, as a two, was built two stories tall. And you probably know that the lower part is a kind of undercroft with wonderful Guastavino vaults, this extraordinary uh, inventive engineered vaulting system chocked full of big stuff because the big stuff was supposed to go in the higher ceiling upper hall but they mix, miscalculated the floor strength so since 1926 the Sphinx and the the palace of Merneptah columns have been in this low ceiling space the palace of Merneptah columns the upper hall was designed so that those could be erected to their full height. Mm -hmm. And they will move. They will move. And you will live to see it. <laughs> but it's, it's nice to have you all. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you. Thank you for coming here.